This program was made possible by a generous grant from the Parker Foundation. Gerald and Inez Parker. Romance of the Ranchos. The words bring images perpetuated in song and film of happy times, of fiestas, of caballeros dressed in outfits trimmed in silver, and their ladies twirling around a dance floor in long dresses with swirling skirts. Certainly there was that. But there were also long hours of tedious work. 300 Native Americans helped build Rancho Guajome. And there were also reports of a leading ranchero getting away with murder. At one adobe, modern visitors swear they've heard ghosts. These rancheros of North San Diego County were pioneers who lived off the land via cattle, crops, and their strength of character. After Mexico's successful revolution from Spain culminated in 1821, Mexican governors in California began distributing land grants, some of them huge, like the giant 133,000-acre Rancho Santa Margarita y Las Flores, most of which is now one of the largest Marine Corps bases in the world. And some of them were small, down now to only a few acres. Movie stars of their times played bit to major roles in the ranchos. Joan Crawford donated the big tree in the courtyard at Buena Vista, and Charlie Chaplin visited. It was owned by Margarita Fisher, a big star in silent films, and her husband, Harry Pollard, a Hollywood director. And Leo Carrillo, of Cisco Kid television fame, owned his own rancho, reflecting the heritage of his ranchero forebears. Some of the ranchos, Guajome, Buena Vista, and Carrillo, are in public ownership with tours on a regular basis. Others, like those on the Marine Base, still allow the public, but on a more restricted basis. Some owners, like Shelley Caron, schedule regular school groups to view her Maron Adobe, and others, like Pat and Karen Kelly on portions of the old Rancho Agua Edionda, still revere the adobe, part of their own private home. Much of the ranch land, including most of the current city of Carlsbad, and property that was once owned by Oceanside City Councilman John Steiger, have given way to modern development. In this series, KOCT remembers the adobes and ranchos of early California. In a deal bitterly contested in court, the Moron family, which had owned the original Rancho Agua Edionda, lost most of its holdings, 13,000 acres, to a man named Francis Hinton, who, childless, in turn willed it to his ranch manager, Robert Kelly. Robert Kelly, also childless, left the huge rancho, including most of the city of Carlsbad, to his brother Matthew's nine children. Pat and Karen Kelly live on the part of the rancho inherited by Pat's father, Carol. As the youngest son of the youngest son of the youngest son, Pat counts back one less generation than his peers of the same age. He has maintained the two foot thick walls of the old Maron adobe on his property, tearing down the wobbly kitchen, but renovating the rest of the house as bedrooms, first for his own family as he was raising it, and now for the new generation to visit. A bow house, as for bows with arrows, is one of the oldest structures on the property as well. The Kellys tell how the nine children divided the rancho by lottery, with Pacific Coast frontage being considered the worst of the deal, the seashores being less conducive to raising cattle. I'm Pat Kelly, this is my wife Karen. Uh, this is our home, it has been for for uh, since the 19, late 1950s, been my home, and Karen's for almost that long. Uh, the home was originally built in 18, 
the 1840s, we think. It, it's the original ranch house for the Agua Edionda Mexican land grant. It was given to Juan Maria Romoldo Marone. It went from, from the Marones to Francis Hinton in 1865, and then to 1870, it went to Robert Kelly, who was a great uncle of mine. And when he died in 1890, the ranch was given to all his nieces and nephews, of which there were still nine alive, uh, two of which died in infancy and the other nine were still alive, and they were raised on at Los Quiotes, which is off the edge of the, of this, the big ranch, the Rancho Avadionda. Rancho Avadionda was about 13,311 acres, they calculate, and this is the original ranch house for it. And so, if you'd like, we'll go in and have a look around. Okay, we're gonna go into the old part of the house. This part was, was remodeled in 1957. Uh, when they remodeled it, they said that the old unstructuralized adobe, that's adobe with, with mud and straw and manure <laughs> only, uh, had no structural strength whatsoever. And so they put reinforced concrete in all, the, in all the partition walls and all the corners and then a bond beam that tied the whole thing together. Originally, the, when Juan Maria Marone built this, he had sh shorter walls, maybe seven feet, and a, they put in a sod roof. Uh, it was made up with, with round rafters and then smaller, <laughs> uh, and smaller and smaller materials down to where they had real fine brush and then about a foot of dirt on top of that. Uh, and it said that it worked fairly well to keep the rain out. <laughs> uh, and it was uh, kept the kept it from being so hot in the summertime. Yeah, in 1869 or 1870, uh, Francis Hinton, who got the, the ranch from Philippa Marone, he raised the walls up to 12 feet and put on a, a shingle roof. And then Pop brought it down to, yeah, then, yeah. to, to yeah. the standard of the day of eight feet, and that was in 1957. So let's go in, I'll show you. This is the sala, or living room, from the original section of the house. Uh, as you can see, the walls were two adobe thick, 26 inches thick, and that was thought to be the standard of the day. The windows were like this when they were set on the inside. This one's now set on the outside, which gives you an area for decorative things and, and uh, a different feel. And the old adobe, one of the best parts about it in the summer, is it's very cool. One of the worst things about it in the winter is it's very cold. And, um, but it is, it's, a, it's a, a wonderful insulation tool. So, and all the adobes were also built on site. And that's probably one of the reasons why they were used in, uh, in doing, in, in, you know, in, in building it originally. Um, our kids were raised here and our grandkids are here often, and we just hope for generations that the house will be um, as comfortable and as uniting as it has been for the two of us. Originally in this structure, there were four rooms, uh, all in a row, this being the master bedroom, and uh, the master bedroom of Juan Maria Marone and his wife, Felipa. I, and they would come out here and spend summer times, I understand, here in winter in downtown San Diego. Uh, this may have been the biggest piece of property they had. They had property also in Mexico, or what is today Mexico. Um, and he being Juan Maria Marone got the property because he was politically connected in San Diego. He made up a design or design and submitted it to Governor Alvarado of Alta California or Mexico. And it was granted this rancho, which was three leagues in size and ran from south of Palom Airport Road to just north of the Avadionda Lagoon about four and a half miles and east-west from the Motion out to San Marcos 
which was about five and a half miles. 13,311 acres, they figured. So it was a big ranch. <laughs> these, were, these were given to us by, by Karen's father, these lithographs that are by T. Wade. And uh, what did you tell them? Well, they're, they're kind of fun because many of them are of the ranch itself. Um, he took a lot of artistic license with them, but they're still very recognizable. And he does, he's done a lot of, um, a lot of local buildings. We have the Mission and the McGee House and, and several others, but they're just kind of a fun addition to, um, to the history portion of the ranch. Well, we're standing now in the third room, and this room was made uh, in 1957 in the remodel, was made into a bathroom, which is to my left, and closets here and here, um, and uh, made it into a more modern home, which uh, we needed to have. No more outhouses. <laughs> Interior plumbing, very important. <laughs> um, I also wanted to talk about this, this uh, drawing behind me, which I think is interesting because it shows how the, the Rancho Awe, the Onda, was divided up among the nine siblings uh, in, in, the, uh, in the 1890s. Um, John L. Kelly uh, was like a surveyor, and he drew this up. They drew it up where almost all the lots came to El Camino Real so they could fence it on either side and and nobody had to open gates <laughs> which was important then and yet they all had access to 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 their lots but the the way they made the decision is that they divided the the rancho up into these into these uh, uh, spaces on thought of uh, what the value was some are bigger some are smaller depending on whether it was an agricultural land or or good pasture land, have close water. close to the railroad. Yeah, etc. And then they put the names into a hat and all of the siblings drew their inheritance of what was gonna be their parcel. They labeled each of the parcels with, um, with letters and then they put the letter on a chit and threw it all in the hat and each of the kids pulled out their inheritance and they got what they got. Uh, it seemed to work out well and they were very satisfied, although the parcels are quite diverse and some are much bigger than, than others. Also this one though, up here in this corner, um, that was Silvestri Marones and he's Juan Maria's brother and that ranch actually went to Silvestre. Um, Silvestre had grazing rights to the whole ranch and Robert, but Robert actually owned the land so they made a deal with one another and Robert gave Silvestre a buck, a dollar for, um, to pay for him giving up all rights to grazing on the ranch. And Silvestre gave Robert a buck to, uh, for, for the full rights to the property that his brother left him. That's, that's a lot of, that's, that's a lot for a dollar. <laughs> was one of our bedrooms for our kids I studied at the desks and spent a lot of time here and on this side it's a, the whole house is one that's well used we it's a great gathering place it's a great party house uh, there's we've had weddings and all kinds of celebrations here and it's, uh, it's been well lived in since it was built in the 1840s standing now would have been the original kitchen when the four rooms were built uh, was added sometime after that and um, currently it's part of a, an addition that was made much later on but right here is a Uncle Robert's clock Uncle Robert being Robert Kelly 
and he bought the clock on a trip to England and brought it back to the ranch. And so this is the oldest piece that we have that was representative of that time period. Um, we have a portrait of Uncle Robert. In fact, one of the things I like about it is that I think that my husband, Pat, when he's standing next to the portrait, I think you can really see a family resemblance, and it's something that we've enjoyed. We are now in uh, one of the new bedrooms that were added on to the old adobe, and we're in here because I wanted to show you this bed that my, was, my parents bought this bed in 1929 when they got married, it was a, <laughs> like a, a, a wedding present to themselves. But they bought it from someone in, in Olivenhain and it was used at that time, a used bed um, that reportedly came around the horn. So it's... So this is one of the oldest pieces in the house that um, is of a period, of that certain period. There is one more piece and that's... That's my great-grandmother's rocker. And her and name was Emily, Emily Porter, Porter Kelly. And uh, she was the wife of Matthew Kelly. And then we have one last thing we'd like to show you, and that's uh, that special dust. <laughs> that's the bow shop. This is the last stop on our tour. We're outside of one of the oldest outbuildings on the ranch. Um, we don't know all of its use, all of its purposes, but we know at one point it was used as a milking shed, probably even a cold storage shed. But when Pat's dad uh, remodeled the ranch, he was an avid archer and he used it to make and repair his bows and keep his archery equipment. So it came to be known among the family as the bow shop. So we use the bow shop all the time today, but basically for storage. Um, and behind me, uh, it's probably worth pointing out that that pepper tree is from the Mission San Luis Rey and it's, um, it's one of the oldest uh, of all the vegetation that we have here at the ranch. It's about 150 years old. And we have one other, which is a, a guava, a guava tree, and it's also 150 years old and it's still producing fruit. I guess that does it. I think that does it. wraps up the tour. Thank uh, you for coming to our home. I hope you enjoyed it. In another part of Carlsbad, Susan Kelly, a great granddaughter, and Marvin Sippel, a retired Carlsbad school teacher whose late wife Lucia was a Kelly granddaughter, tell the story of how the Kellys obtained such a wonderful piece of property. My name is Susan Kelly. My father was William Allen Kelly. His father was Alan Oscar Kelly. His father was William Sherman Kelly. His father was Matthew J. Kelly, who was brothers with Robert Kelly, who inherited the Rancho Ahedionda from Francis Hinton, who had acquired the rancho from Juan Maria Marone's descendant, his wife and his oldest son in the early 1870s. When my great, great, great grandfather came over from the Isle of Man with his nine children, they were all, his, he was John, his oldest son was John, his other son was Robert, there was a Matthew, William, and a few others. But every time you look at the genealogy, which makes it tremendously confusing for anyone who isn't intimately acquainted with it, 
There's, in each generation, there's a William, there's a Matthew, there's a Robert, there's a John. So my great-grandfather is William S., so he's W.S. Kelly. My dad was William Allen Kelly, and there's always a William, there's always an Al well, there wasn't Allens, but there was Williams and Roberts and Matthews, and if you weren't very concerned with keeping track of genealogy, and I think it's true in most people's history that they, you know, the Maroons certainly had it with the Juan Marias and the Juan Felipes. Everybody was being named after an uncle or a brother or something, and they never brought in any new blood with new names. This John Kelly is my great, great, great grandfather. His son, Matthew, married Emily Porter. They had the nine kids that ended up in, uh, inheriting the ranch. And my great grandfather was William S. Kelly. And Alan Kelly, Alan O. Kelly was my grandfather. William Allen Kelly is my dad. And here I am, Susan Kelly. When my great-grandfather and his sisters and brothers, there were three basic families in the area. There were the Squires who lived out in Vista. There were uh, the Kellys who lived here in Carlsbad. There were the Marones and a few others. And for the most part, everybody knew everybody and there wasn't a large dating pool to say the least. And at one time, they, one summer they all went um, the Squires and the Kellys went to uh, camping up at Palmar Mountain and they decided on that camping trip who was essentially who was going to marry whom. So William Sherman, my great-grandfather, married Lavinia Squires. His sister married Hamilton Squires and so my grandfather and uh, Ida Dawson were then double cousins because their parents married their brother and sisters married brother and sister. Well, that didn't come out right, but you know what I mean. And um, so there, there, and there was a, there's a lot of that in the Charles Kelly family side as well. There's double cousins in there as well. My name is Marvin Sippel, and I, my relationship is that I'm married into the family, so I'm an in-law. I married Lucia Kelly Sippel. We met at Whittier College, and both of us were in teaching and education. So my relationship is after getting married and establishing my teaching career at, both in Escondido and over here at Carlsbad High, working with the family and working on the ranch and helping to just enjoy the lifestyle that we had living out here in the country. They found several different matates and the Indians would either leave them if they were worn out. I had found one that it was worn out so I used it in a little water course. But if the other ones were still usable, they would place them in a, a certain spot and come back the next year because they would get fish and, and uh, clams and things out of the lagoons and come up and shell their fish. So they used those also for grinding, obviously, acorns and other meals, other grains. But yeah, there were several matates found here. A few arrowheads were found on the ranch itself, but most of the arrowhead collection that we have is, was purchased by William Sherman and other family members. On the ranch, they found an artifact that was uh, determined to be made by the early Indians, and it was determined by the archeologists to be a bear. And it was then sent up to Sacramento, and it's in the museum out there in Sacramento. It was found here in the ranch as part of the artifacts of the early people. That became the official artifact for the state of California. That's where the, the bear is and up in Sacramento to denote its importance to California history. We have uh, seven or eight brands. The one that's probably the most prominent was the F.H. brand for Francis Hinton. And as Susan mentioned, Francis Hinton is the one, the, the businessman who acquired the ranch through the, the business dealings with uh, the Maroon family. So uh, we have th those brands there. And uh, I actually used one or two when we were branding calves. When I first married in the family, we still ran cattle. 
and we branded a few calves on the ranch and uh, so those were used for identifying because if you could not identify your animal, you could not prove that somebody's animal was, was yours or yours was theirs or somebody stole your animal. Sometimes we are not, sometimes one occasion we had an animal stolen and the brands would, were then to protect you. Well, the animal did not have a brand so we couldn't claim it as ours. Although it came off the land, it had no brand on it. So brands were very important. Brands are used to identify the animal, and this happened to be an FH brand. And so this actually was used on a horse, but they also had smaller ones for calves. And then when you had it branded on the animal, this is what it looked like. So FH would be the Francis Hinton, the gentleman who acquired the ranch through the business dealings from the Marone family. So these are the brands and these are the results you'd have. That was an identifier. Yeah, my late wife, Lucia, put all the family letters that had been gathered from the 1870s and 80s into the early 1900s and had to have them organized into different categories as to who was writing to whom. And so I'm in the process of scanning those letters and we were, our plan is to set up a website so the family can access that information for history as well as the general public can access it because much of the history of Carlsbad is focused around much of Kelly family history because the, the land here was mostly identified with the Kelly Ranch. The house behind me is a house built in 1960 by Alan and Catherine Kelly, my in-laws, and they built the house uh, out of adobe and uh, the big tree that is in the front there is a peppermint tree that has uh, supposed to be a small tree but, or a medium sized tree but it's turned into be a huge tree. The railing coming up has insulators from the old electric lines and a few of them over here in the side too as well but they're to provide a little accent for the railing. This is actually a painting of the original Los Quixotes homestead that was homesteaded by my great-great-grandfather, Matthew Kelly. The original painting is by William Webster Borden, who was married to Matthew Kelly's second oldest daughter, Minnie. This area up here was actually the Rancho Ahedionda, and he homesteaded right on the edge of it and his brother at the time was managing the rancho and he built this house. And while these two houses never really were at, in place at the same time, the bottom floor of this is actually now the main house at the Carrillo Ranch. Um, when Carrillo took over, he took off the second story and added more building out here to make and put the pool in down this way and the, the well is down there, or the spring. This program was made possible by a generous grant from the Parker Foundation. Gerald and Inez Parker.